So I'm delighted that it brings Gary Steingart back to our show today. Hi. Hi, great to be back. Super sad, true love story is set in the future. How far in the future did you imagine it to be? Well, so you have a completely illiterate America falling apart. Uh, the, as you said, the Yuan is dominant. China rules the whole country. Uh, next Tuesday, I think, is <laughs> what we're aiming for. <laughs> well, the New York Times has become the New York Lifestyle Times. <laughs> uh, what's happened to hard news in this new world? In this world, uh, everyone is sort of a, a journalist themselves. Everybody streams about their lives, about their weight, their calorie counts, their carb counts, and stuff like that. There is no hard news. And there are no organizations that send people out to find the news. Everything is just about your own life. You teach writing at Columbia University. Uh, I hope your students are better than some of the people here. Because not, <laughs> not much serious reading is done anymore. People comment that books smell bad. Yes, a lot of the younger generation in this book, and I think in real life, also do, does find that books smell pretty bad. Uh, a friend of mine who uh, is in, the, in her 20s, she calls books doorstops. And her friends call them doorstops because that's what they're most useful for. But she, they're still reading, aren't they? They're just no, reading Kindles and, and read, other e-books? No, I, think, I don't think they're reading. I think there's a lot of internet shopping that's a lot of fun. Uh, there's a lot of rating. In this book, in Super Sad True Love Story, everybody always rates one another. So the moment you enter into a room, let's say, you know you're the 13th ugliest person in the room. And, and you have the 8th best credit rating and, and the ninth best person. There's an app, actually, on an, a, 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 an iPhone-like thing that's called an apparat. Yes, it's called the apparat. And that reveals everything. You walk into a room and people immediately know where you rank in the hierarchy. Where you rank, you know, if you suffered any child abuse, everything is automatically revealed revealed the moment you walk into a room, everybody, there, there is no privacy anymore in this book. Everybody knows everything about everyone else. I'm not, uh, and then here we have Lenny. He seems to be the last of the readers. Were you inspired at all by Fahrenheit 451? I was inspired by my life, being, <laughs> being the last reader in America, uh, or one of the few, the hundred thousand few. Uh, yes, I was inspired by Fahrenheit 451. The difference is, in Fahrenheit 451, the government went out and actually burned the books. Here, it's something a little more insidious. It's not the government, it's the people. They've given up on reading, and there's no, there's just no reading being done. And no introspective life, no rumination, no meditation. Do you see evidence of text speak in your students' prose? OMG, I do not. Uh, or oh, MFG, I guess. Uh, I do not. Uh, but I, in the book, there are certain... Uh, I've invented several new acronyms, like Timatov, think I'm about to openly vomit, mm -hmm. and then JBF, which I can't really say on a no, family uh, radio, don't. but, you know, it's... Uh, <laughs> I've had so much fun with acronyms. It's really interesting. I mean, you know, uh, these kids, for example, at Columbia, and the undergrads, they're, they're brilliant, you know, but they're, they're slowly entering the world, the post-literate, post-book uh, world, where their information is constantly being sliced and diced into tiny little pieces. So they're great at, at multitasking, they're great at understanding 30 different things at once, but they can't put them all together. Maybe. And in this book, it's sort of, there's a love story between Lenny, who represents that old generation, and the woman he loves is 15 years younger, which, you know, 15 years, it's not exactly May, December, it's like maybe August, September romance. But already, because of how fast things are moving, their lives are so different that there's really nothing to connect them except some of their rankings are overlap. Well, they both have uh, refugee parents, immigrant parents, and certain experiences that they share. Yes, yes, it's true. Both have dysfunctional immigrant parents. And, uh, dysfunctional immigrant parents, they're the, they're the stuff literature is made of these days. Uh, in your books especially. <laughs> <laughs> now, where, where did this start? Uh, did this start with thinking about how your students were writing differently than they would have a generation earlier? No, it started with just noticing that things were, were changing very quickly and then trying to create the characters. Uh, these are the first characters I've written where I, I, I really kind of love them. I, I really care for what happens to them and the way that they interact. You know, my, my last book had a 325-pound protagonist with a bad circumcision. It was clear that I was putting him through some satiric paces. Here it's a little different. I understand both of them, and I understand how they both want to reach out to one another. Uh, it's just that they can't communicate because communication itself has gone out the window. All that's left are the little bleeps, the little electronic digital bleeps that we hear. Did, were you writing this when the economic meltdown started? <laughs> you know, was, I started writing this in 2006, and when I started writing this, I thought, oh my god, okay, things are not going, going to go well for this country, no matter what people say. The banks are going to collapse. I took a ride in a Chevrolet. I said, there's no way this company's going to survive, you know, with these nice Hyundais rolling off the assembly line. 
And as I started writing, you know, all these things started happening, and I became very upset because this is the problem, you, you know, with writing a novel. That we, there's no present anymore. We live in the future all the time. So I constantly have to make things worse and worse and worse until the whole country falls apart and is bought up by a Norwegian hedge fund. My guest is Gary Steingard, whose latest novel is called Super Sad True Love Story. It's published by Random House. Um, people talk about the American Restoration Authority or the ARA. What's that? The American Restoration Authority is the last ditch attempt of this government, a pretty authoritarian government. Uh, the, the only party left is called the Bipartisan Party. And uh, it's the American Restoration Authority is the last attempt to get the country together so that it can still compete with China and other places. But they can't even repair, repair the Williamsburg Bridge, which collapses in the course of the book. The infrastructure is another huge problem. Everything just falls apart as the book continues. Well, the Williamsburg Bridge is probably going to collapse anyway. I'm afraid to walk on it. I'm afraid to fly over it. It might explode and damage the airplane. The Secretary of State, Rubenstein, is mentioned more often than the President. So in the New World, would the Secretary of State be the most important diplomat? That was a little bit of a hyperbole on my part. It really would have been the Secretary of the Treasury who would be the most important person. But I always wanted to have a Jewish strongman. There's not enough Jewish dictators outside of Netanyahu. I really wanted a nice Jewish strongman. So I had a Defense Secretary, Rubenstein, who was also completely incompetent, too. You tell the book in two different first persons, his and hers. Oh, why that approach? I've always wanted to write from the point of view of a woman, you know, a young and you woman never in this case. I never have until you it's always, your story? No, no, it's always some big, you know, schlumpy Jewish guy. Oh, look at me, look at me. Uh, I wanted to try something different to, to have, an, and she's a daughter of Korean immigrants, so she has a very particular kind of syntax, and she's also Southern California, and so she has all these different th sides to her that, that I think make her very expressive in a different way than what you're used to seeing in literature. Well, one of the things, as you pointed out earlier, that hasn't changed in this new world is that immigrant parents still push their children to succeed. Yes, yes. No, of course. I went to Stuyvesant High School in Manhattan, where I still remember my average, which is the same as Lenny Abramov's average, 86.894. Uh, yeah, I remember our parents would go bananas if we only got into Cornell or University of Pennsylvania. Princeton! Where Princeton? It still shocks me to this day. There are a lot of National Guard checkpoints staffed by soldiers with guns. What, what are they guarding? Nothing. There's nothing left to guard. You always know a country's in bad shape when there's a lot of tanks and nothing to guard. I mean, that was the former Soviet Union would show up and there'd be, you know, checkpoints everywhere and people standing around. And there was there was no economy left. And people are instructed to forget that they saw the checkpoints. Did they do that in, in the Soviet Union? In the Soviet Union, you need to forget pretty quickly. <laughs> the moment you saw anything bad, you avert your eyes. When you look at the, the latest thing I just read the other day that Vladimir Putin sang old Soviet songs with these return alleged spies, although I, I haven't figured out what they ever spied about. Uh, and that struck me as really odd. It's not really that odd. I mean, Russia is desperate. Soviet songs? Desperate. The Soviet times were the best times for, the, for, for Russia in, in centuries. I mean, after, the, you know, after Peter the Great, there was nothing for a while. Then Stalin, he was pretty great in terms of making the country feel like it's part of like it's a giant superpower. Russia and America, these are why maybe I'm so lucky to have these two countries to write about. Russia and America are both ginormous countries. They're too big for their own good at times, and they have these messianic ideas about what they are. I wasn't lucky enough to be born in Denmark or, or Italy or some other small country with a faded past. I had to grow up in these two failing empires. Get me out of here. <laughs>